so with that, we'll we'll probably kind of end this, and we can we can kind of open up to questions if you guys have any additional questions. I, I had a question about the video that you did and actually the timing of that. Was that video was that a visualization video of what the product would become, or was that a video of what the product was? Right. So so at the time we were doing the interview, it was a visualization. Like we we had a bunch of screenshots that we put together. And we knew because we had experience with the box lot product just what the times would be for the sharing. So we kind of artificially like simulated that. But what we were really trying to do, and that's a great question, is that we didn't really actually build all these screens out. We actually just did this video as a as a visualization. But but the the, the idea there was not to trick the customers, but to say that this is really what we're going to deliver. And we felt we didn't have any problems delivering that. Um, so you can fall into traps where you kind of overpromise and then don't have have that to follow up. But in our case, because we had this other product, we didn't feel like we had um, that risk. And then later on, as we did build the MVP out, we actually built a real video, um, which had the screens changed. You know, obviously from the feedback, they changed more, but we did build a real video that we put on the side as well. But that's a great question, and I would say that the, the video is very powerful. And uh, you probably heard of the Dropbox case study, but that was an example where the the founder there, Drew Drew Houston, was building this Dropbox product, which um, you know, in some ways, has similar value proposition to what we were doing with with, a, with Box Cloud, but a very different approach and different solution. But the way that he kind of uh, did his MVP was also a video, and it was it was probably using part of the product, but it was in a stage where it was not ready for for general consumption. Yeah, I remember a lot of the Dropbox videos, and they were kind of line drawing. And yeah. Oh, but I, but I'm talking about but I'm, but but his his original video was actually a was actually a video of using the product, but but I don't think it was a complete like a, it was at that point the product wasn't completely done and so where I was going with that is that that video went viral he had built a lot of like smart Easter eggs and the vi the video went viral he had seventy five thousand to hundred thousand people that expressed interest in the product just based on that video and he 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 floated it in Hacker News and it kind of really went viral after that. He used that to like recruit his his co-founder, basically get funding from Y Combinator, just on the basis of that interest he was able to generate around the video. And in his application, it's it's still there. You can go and find it. He actually estimated that the time it would take him to build the product and and ship it out would be three months. It took them a year and a half to actually build the product and, and ship it out. And that's again where like if if he had waited to build that video after he had built the product, it had probably been too long. And finding ways to put something out that customers can visualize, even if it's, even if it's like cobbling things together or like faking it. But as long as you, you feel you can deliver on that experience down the road, that's perfectly, perfectly fine. Well, I was also thinking about even in the interviews that you're having with people, depending on you know, the interviewer, you might present questions or present information in slightly different ways. You can, you can be getting different responses without having kind of like a visualization, especially if you're talking about something they haven't seen before. Mm -hmm. So I, I missed that part. So you're saying if you're showing them a visualization? Yeah, it's, when you're carrying on these interviews, you do a visualization. You have the video that would be a visualization of the product, it, especially if it's something that's unlike something yes. before. Yes. And whether that could improve the quality of the interviews versus just having somebody describe it, somebody can kind of describe it better. Than oh, I, absolutely. I mean, so, and I, and I think that if you describe it, it's, it's very hard for customers to visualize what you're talking about. In your mind, you might see this, this crystal clear solution and, and how it's going to work. But for them, I mean, they, they come from that problem domain, and they may not really quite see the same thing you're seeing. Um, and so it's, it's, it's very important to like kind of bring that down to something, something tangible that they can look at and, and critique and give you feedback on. Oh, it was just done. Done myself, so there are lots of um, lots of tools like ScreenFlow and other things on the Mac, just screencasting type software. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So for me, there were a bunch of screens we had put together, and I was just yeah recording the mouse movements and then just putting it together. So what about product market fit? Is that like a whole other scenario? Yeah. So. So, so it's not one that I'm going to cover here, but I can I can kind of talk through what happened if you're interested, like what actually happened, kind of going forward with the with the product. Um, so I, I will kind of say that what we talked about here was the problem solution fit. So with this particular product, what what happened is we 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 went out um, 
and with the moms, for example, we were able to to get a, uh, we, there was a, there was pretty good conversion. We were able to get the interviewer, the interviewees that we talked to, to sign up for the product, to actually pay us money, to actually give us good testimonials that went on the website. The struggles that we we ran into after afterwards was really finding scalable ways to to find more moms that weren't people we were interviewing. So it became a problem that. Um, that is, it, 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 was, it was something that, that people weren't actively looking for because they didn't quite know that something existed that was better than their alternative. So they were rather finding workarounds to the large file sharing problem than really tackling it on, on head on. The other thing that we actually discovered, which is something I share with a lot of people when I talk about saving time, is that the parents market was a very interesting market to, to learn with. And we were able to build this product, which like I said, we, found we had parents paying for it and loving it at the end. But even early on, like setting up those interviews was very, very difficult because um, as we would, we would set up an interview with a mom, we would set up this time in the afternoon and depending on whether the baby went to sleep or not, the interviews got pushed out or got canceled. Um, so, so the whole thing that we, is that we were trying to market a product to, to, to moms that were inherently very busy um, made that a problem to also get their attention down the road. And I think parents in general, once you have the kids, the fact is you are very busy. And so in parallel, we were, we were pursuing the, the um, photographer market, and we, we latched onto the wedding photographer market, and there we had much better kind of uh, traction because we had these photographers who were really motivated to use something like this to, to simplify their sharing workflow and were willing to pay for it. So after a while, like, we, were, we were pursuing both of these things in, in parallel. We didn't, we didn't discontinue the mom market, but we had two versions of the site. One was a consumer-oriented site, the other was a pro site. And on the pro side, we were getting a lot more interest, a lot more more traction. So, so talking about product market fit, there was a, there's a whole process there of how do you, once you put the product out there, get feedback from from those photographers, from those moms, make the product better, and kind of tune it. So, like with the moms' cases, we we kept looking for for more scalable ways. We we started talking to mommy bloggers and got some traction there, but it was just a much easier path for us to go down that wedding photographer market um, for for a while. Um, well, actually, if, if you want, like, I, I don't want to keep people beyond the, the yeah. 5 o'clock. So if people want to leave, you know, feel free to leave. I'm happy to, like, continue on the, the story because I do have, like, one or two slides and I can talk about what happened with the product. But if you feel to leave, you know, don't, it, it, just feel free to get up and leave if you have to. But I will say that, so with this particular product, what, what happened? So I, I, talk about, uh, I, I talk about this a lot lately with, with, um, with, with what I write about and, and my lessons learned from this. So this last company was built around a, a technology vision. And that first product didn't quite work out. And what I did instead was take that solution and look for viable problems to go solve. And while that is not a bad place to be, so there, you know, it gives you an advantage, but it does constrain your business model. And I find a lot of technology commercialization problems, projects to be in that same space where there's this great technology. But it's a hard thing to find because there's, there's a lot of love, there's a lot of passion for the, 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 for the solution. And sometimes you end up with places where you don't necessarily intend it to go. So even though I was more than happy to, to like find a viable business and was interested more from an uh, almost academic sense to see if customer development lean startup would help me find a viable business model for Cloudfire, I, I was not particularly um, motivated to like build a service for moms long term. Like I didn't want to be the outside the building guy and try to build that community. So I had two options. One was either find somebody to come in there and um, and help me build that community. With the wedding photographers, I was I'm not that into photography to begin with. It was really something that I kind of um, saw as a viable way of, of solving solving these problems. So again, the, the the channels I had to build required me going to photo events, like immersing myself in that world, which I didn't particularly want to do, more, more from interests of mine. So I, I had two choices, again, get somebody else on the team to do it or find something else. And so at that point, um, I had started doing a lot of this lean startup stuff and was spending a disproportionate amount of time writing and like doing the lean canvas in parallel. And it seemed to me like the dots were beginning to connect, like I felt like I could actually build a business around, around that. So that was a hard reset that I had to hit. Uh, and so talking about that journey of the entrepreneur I was talking about, the earlier stage was building stuff because it was fun and cool to build. The, the second stage was survival, trying to build viable businesses, and that's what Cloudfire and BoxCloud were really about. And the final stage for me was really finding that purpose. And I, for me, that has to be finding passion with not just a solution, 
but more importantly, the problems and the customers that you're addressing. So if you're trying to build a solution, um, and, and it happens to be that lawyers are the best customer, I'm going to pick on lawyers, but it happens to be that lawyers are the best customer for that, and you can't stand lawyers, that's going to be a problem. Maybe not in the short term, but definitely in the long term, because you're going to be getting customer requests from them. You're going to have to live in their world, and that's not something you'll be able to be happy with after a while. So for me, like finding that is, is like my new kind of way of, when I look at problems worth solving, I go back to this prioritization, and I also talk about having passion for the problem and the, solu and the, and the customers being a, a very important aspect of finding something that's worthwhile doing. Because as I mentioned early on, startups can, can consume years of your life. And, and people do startups for many different reasons. If you're in it to do a quick exit, you know, all of these approaches are fine. But if you're in it kind of for a longer haul, the, 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 uh, the better formula that I find is finding a problem that you are passionate about that you can dedicate a good, a good enough amount of time to and, and really come up with multiple solutions, not really bind yourself to one, but even multiple. And you see that pattern even applied in examples like Twitter. So even the founder of Twitter, Ev Williams, um, even though he, is, he did Twitter, if you look at the last three companies he started and even the next one he's going to do, they're all about some kind of a micro blog variation. They're all about finding shorter and better, faster ways to, to create cohesive, to, to basically create communication with other people. And that is the problem that he immersed himself with and has been building products one startup after the other. And that's the problem that he feels like gives him, gives him satisfaction. So for me, with all the lean startup stuff, I, I tend to find that the customers I really want to service are the entrepreneurs like you folks in the room. And, and that's where I had the most, most passion, the most enjoyment. So I figured a, a way to connect the dots and, and build a business around that. So, so, but, but even going back to the selling question, um, interestingly enough, the, the person I sold the company to was my first customer. So th that, that company was bootstrapped. And the way it got bootstrapped is I was building the technology solution. And I got a random call from another entrepreneur in Norway who was looking for a similar type of platform, couldn't find any. And I told, almost turned him down and said, you know, our solution isn't built yet. It's about 60% done. And he said, well, don't hang up the phone. I'll, I'll happily pay for you to finish that. And I, I've got funding. I'll, I'll kind of subsidize your payment. In exchange, can you build this custom app for us? And can you give us a, a better deal? And so that started the conversation. And that's how the, how, how the company got bootstrapped and how we ran for a long time building the, the technology platform and then experimenting with products like BoxCloud and CloudFire, making them, well, BoxCloud became sustainable. CloudFire reached this point where I kind of decided I was going to hit the reset button. And so I went back to him because all along the way, he had been asking to actually purchase the assets or own the assets because a lot of his investors felt uncomfortable banking their future on some startup in, in Austin. And even though we had escrows and things like that, he was more, it was, a, it was a very easy conversation. So I went back to him and said, I'm finally ready to kind of get out of this business. Um, and you can take all this, these products, all this learning, and go do something else with it. And within two weeks, we had a deal, and the company was sold. And they are now taking the technology platform, and they're building the new company is called Channel.pro, C-H-N-L.pro. And they're using a lot of these technologies to, to build similar type of services, but with a kind of slightly different twist, which you can go check out on their site. It's not completely launched yet, but they are um, they're kind of put, taking, carrying the torch forward from here. So anyways, thanks a lot for coming. And I'll stick around for a little bit if you have any, any more questions. But thanks, everyone, for coming. <laughs>